And so our first panel of the day will be uh, superintendents and union presidents from two districts that have been in the lead on Common Core implementation uh, in, in, in this region. Um, we have uh, Karen Schauer, who is the superintendent of uh, Galt Unified Education, uh, excuse me, Galt Unified School District, and Kristen Zipper, uh, who's the president of the Galt Education Association, if you want to come up. And from Elk Grove, uh, we have Stephen Glad, the superintendent, and Maggie Ellis, who is the president of the Elk Grove Education Association. And I, because of the video setup, I'm going to stay where I am and uh, ask questions from here. Uh, so um, we're going to ask them to talk a little bit about the strategies that they've adopted, about the, uh, and the, these mics are on. Uh, about the strategies that they've adopted and some of the challenges that they faced in uh, beginning implementation of the Common Core. So, <coughs> excuse me. Um, I'll start with uh, Superintendent Glad. From Glad. I'm glad to be here. Oh, Glad. Yes. Well, I'm glad you're glad. And, and I am glad. Delighted to meet you, Superintendent. I'm so serious. <laughs> I apologize. No worries. No worries. Okay. Um, so, so uh, uh, Superintendent Led, uh, how does this, the Common Core, the implementation of Common Core state standards, fit strategically within the vision uh, that you've adopted in the Elk Grove District? Uh, where has the district been going, and what have you emphasized as you go through the implementation process? Um, as the comments that were made earlier, and I'm going to go back to one that Sue made uh, about the adoption of content standards way back when. The district has been uh, working diligently. Uh, our, our teachers, uh, our administrators have been working for years using content standards and being able to infuse them into the uh, lexicon and the instruction on a daily basis. So we've been looking at direct instruction for a long time. So our vision now shifting to adopting the Common Core standards really was about unbundling them, uh, understanding what they are, looking at the alignment, understanding uh, the nuances of what that would look like and then backward mapping uh, so that people would have a conversation, a robust conversation at the, at the school level and the classroom level and at the district level so that we can understand what the standards are and then building off of that understanding of what um, the standards are, what it entails, begin to do the, uh, the uh, bird walk, if you will, about assessments. And so how will that change our instruction um, from what we have been doing to what is going to be necessary as we make this adjustment into the, the Common Core. And I would suggest that one of the things that was very apparent to all of us was that we have had a number of years in which instruction uh, came from, uh, let's say, open court and English language adoption, which was more or less a recipe. And uh, we're very excited about empowering our great educators to come back and use the talents and skills that they've had uh, to really build lessons they are going to bring robust examples of what needs to happen in the instruction that will lend itself to the assessments that we're now going to have with Common Core. Sure. So, so as we often say, leadership is crucially important in uh, implementation of Common Core, but it's the teachers who actually have to do the work. Um, and so, Maggie Ellis, you wanted to talk a little bit about the CTA's role in implementation in Elk Grove? Well, um, for our association, we've really worked hard to have a partnership and collaboration, and we've both been sending the same message, um, that this is a process. It's not something that's going to happen overnight. Uh, you can imagine, we have a lot of type A teachers. They want to do everything perfectly in our district. Um, our vision has always been to provide the highest quality education for our students. And so we hold ourselves to a very high standard. Um, when all these changes started to happen, it was that it was important for us to let both administrators and teachers know that we don't expect it to be perfect from the opening of the gate the first day of our six calendar schools. Um, it, it's a process, and as we learn, our students learn, we don't expect our students to know it right away, so we can't expect teachers and administrators to know everything right away. Um, Having that joint message and constantly reinforcing that message has been a key, I think, to our success. It brings the stress level down for everyone. 
Um, it, it still is a struggle sometimes to really get it in their brain that, no, we really mean take a breath, learn in steps, achieve, do more, take a step back, collaborate, communicate what's working, what's not working, because we can't provide resources when we don't get that information back. Don't hide. We need to know what's working and what's not working in order to be able to fix it. So having that commitment to each other as well as our school board and to our teachers and to our parents and our students, um, I think that's what's, what's going to continue to make us successful as we move forward in the next five, six, seven years. You know, when I've, I had this, this light bulb go off this weekend when I was talking to some community members, and Sue hit on it. 1997 was a very long, long time ago. And we have a generation of teachers, and we have a generation of families in our school that have never had new standards. They have never had new curriculum. And so that anxiety that it's creating for not only new teachers and administrators and parents is something that long ago, that was just a natural part of the turnover. We knew we were getting new adoptions every six, seven years, and move out the old, here comes the new. We were in that pattern, that mindset. Because we have been somewhat stagnant in those two <coughs> areas for a very long time, uh, we have to fight against that that brain dead section of, of our brains, our minds. And it's exciting to be able to reinfuse that, um, the permission to explore and expand and become learners ourselves once again. We're not just continuing the same curriculum year after year. Now is the time to really explore and make things very exciting. <coughs> so with, with permissions on both sides given to everybody to do that, we're gonna have some really incredible things coming from our students. I've already seen it in my classroom. That's great, thank you. And Superintendent Schauer, uh, same question to you. How, how does the Common Core implementation fit into the vision in uh, Galt Union? And uh, um, where has the district been going and what have you emphasized as you've begun the implementation process? Well, it's, it's wonderful to serve as superintendent in the Galt Joint Union Elementary School District. Um, the vision that has been sustained over time is somewhat captured in a, in a slogan that's been there for years in our district, and it's building a bright future for all learners. And when we look at what the Common Core State Standards mean for our school system and our community, it's really about every child being college and career ready. And I think that um, the sustained work that we've done over time in our district, which is a vision where student learning is in the center and it's supported by professional learning communities really implementing work as a team across the district. It involves attention to students being healthy and engaged. Uh, we have sustained efforts in the area of youth development that we think will be very, very important to further intensify to implement the Common Core. And third, it really is about continuing our work to maximize partnerships as well. Um, what has happened uh, in our school system as we look at Common Core state standards is that we see it more as transformational work versus transitional work. It is a major change, as, as Dr. Kirst, uh, Michael Kirst had shared, it's major, major change. The, um, I was reading a quote that the governor shared uh, at the last state board meeting when he talked about how for California school systems, it's a time of imagination and rigor. And I thought, you know, in our school system, we now have an initiative, we call it the Bright Future for Galt Students Initiative, which I think captures both those things. But it does take time and uh, it does take innovation to make it work. Great. And Kristen Zipper, once again, it's the teachers that actually have to make the change. Um, you want to talk a little bit about what the uh, Education Association is doing in, in Gulf Union? I can. First, let me clarify, I'm not the president of our union. Oh, okay. So, uh, Brian Meddings <laughs> may have an issue with me taking that role on. <laughs> so I am, I am actually a member of the bargaining team, but I am the, the president is a um, release time PE teacher. He's one of our prep teachers and didn't feel like he could adequately speak to this, so I was asked to come. So I just want to clarify that. Okay, so 
as a teacher, the, I, I repeat what she said, we have for many, many years now had our California standards. And so it is really about looking at the different um, avenues in which children learn and really putting those into place in our classroom. Um, I think the biggest support we've had is we do have very strong PLCs in our district. That has been a, a big focus in our district for many years now. So we have had a lot of support in that arena. And so that helps with the transition. Um, the biggest struggle is time. It's, and, and I know that everybody already knows that. Any time that you're putting something in, into place that you need the time not only to plan and prepare, but also to reflect and change as you go. And so that right now I know is the biggest struggle as a union as well as just as a teacher is just trying to make this transition, uh, transformation as smooth as possible for the teachers as well as the students and the families. Um, I think that um, all districts are gonna need to have a really firm play, plan in place of how you're going to allow your teachers that time. Um, it is a struggle and we are also good at advertising that this is a, it's a change and it's a growth and that you're not expected to be perfect out of the gate. But again, there are a lot of teachers that that just isn't good enough because you have those children in front of you every day. And so you want it to be perfect right out of the gate. And so that is something that we all are going to need to struggle with, that we are going to learn together and we will make growth together and that eventually will be a wonderful system for our students. Great. Um, so the, the second question is, uh, how have you worked together to engage your community stakeholders? board members, administrators, teachers, classified staff, union representatives, parents, and community members. Have you had, had many detractors and how have you handled them? And before I ask uh, uh, our folks to, to answer this, I also, I should have asked them to briefly introduce their districts, just so that, so that those in the room who don't know, but also those who are uh, participating remotely, um, have, a, have a better sense of the size and the sort of demographic makeup of the two districts. So, Superintendent Shower, I'll start with you. Sure. Uh, the Galt Elementary School District um, is located 30 miles south of Sacramento. Uh, city of Galt has a population of 22,000 residents. Um, we have six schools, one school readiness center, uh, five elementary <coughs> schools, one middle school, and uh, one school readiness center. We have 63% uh, of, our, of our youth um, have low income uh, family situations. Um, we have a range of 12% to 49% uh, English learners. The uh, ethnicity in our school system, we have uh, about 57% um, Latino, 35% white. Great. And so, so do you want to then go on to, to answer the question of how you've engaged the community? And when, uh, when you brought up community, I think that's some context I'll share because in 2010, um, in the midst of the, of the Great Recession, uh, in a community with um, one of the highest unemployment rates in the state, 25% at one time, um, the community, both the high school district and uh, our district, worked together on the Galt Youth Master Plan. And when I talked about the vision of our school system, I think what's really wonderful about the community of Galt is there is a vision for youth that really lends itself to frame up the support that the community um, needs to demonstrate to support every child being college and career ready. That engagement involved um, not only, say, adults, families, city um, leaders, but it also involved youth in that process. So I, as a superintendent, when I continue to think about engagement, when I look at the data that Sue Stickle presented earlier, and I'm looking at, say, student participation in, say, the rollout of Common Core, that's something that we, we need to really look at because that's somewhat where we started with engagement and moving forward as a community for the youth. Um, what happened um, over time with the communication of the standards and, and making it work is that one of the things our board of trustees did was had a series of study sessions because they felt that they really needed to have a good understanding of the Common Core. And that was beyond our director of curriculum, Judy Bullard, presenting at, a, a, say, a formal board meeting. These sessions happened during discussion meetings. 
Um, that idea for discussion meetings to engage the board publicly to go deep about Common Core State Standards implementation was um, due to work that Davis Campbell, uh, former director of California School Boards Association, provided some technical assistance with us. We're a small school system. We do not have a full-time, um, say, communications director. We have tapped the County Office of Education to provide technical assistance for communications and engagement. Tim Herrera at the County Office of Education also worked with our Board of Trustees to look at language, and we actually, together as a governance team, created some talking points so that as we were engaging conversations with stakeholders, we'd be on the same page. But to be quite honest, our board would say, you know, the Common Core State Standards, it's really hard to explain what it is. There have been um, a series of professional development. Um, Kristen uh, lived this, and I think I was gonna segue to Kristen because there was um, some further engagement that happened with the rollout of Common Core State Standards with our primary grades and what happened during back to school night. Would you talk about that, Kristen? This back to school night this year? Mm -hmm. We, kindergarten and first grade were actually the first two grade levels to roll out Common Core in our district. We have done it by grade span, so I have been the guinea pig because I'm a kindergarten <laughs> teacher. So we rolled out last year for full implementation and then this year two, three has come on board and the next year four, eight is also joining us with full implementation. So this year at our back to school night, we did a presentation of what the Common Core would look like in their kindergarten classroom. We shared with them how different homework would look, how different assessments would look, that they would be you know, living situations as opposed to just having a worksheet in front of them. And so that's the way we handled it at back to school night. And even before that, when we were uh, doing our screening for our parents of incoming kindergartners, we handed them some literature so that they would even have a precursor to even having their children in the door, they would already know what was, you know, going to, their child's education was gonna look a little different this year. Um, we have, there have been parent meetings at both school-wide and district-wide um, with information um, presented, and the newspaper in our district did do a series of articles about Common Core, and so that was from different viewpoints, from teachers' viewpoints, from district viewpoints, so I think there has been quite a bit of information shared in our small town about Common Core. And, and I, I would say that that I've worked, uh, strived very hard to take a look at, say, advisory uh, teams that we have in our school system. And any time I can, um, including bargaining sessions with our classified union and our teachers union, is continue to embed uh, conversations about the Common Core State Standards. Um, in terms of detracting, like what may detract from the effort, I would say that um, to date, I've not um, experienced any, say, detract, detracting, um, say, issues related to uh, the why of the Common Core. I think uh, within our school system and community, it's like we want our, our, our children and youth to be college and career ready in the 21st century. The detracting, um, say, types of things that have happened is maybe more about the how um, about it because what our key way of implementing the Common Core State Standards in our school system is taking a personalized approach. Um, this, the shift that we've made is from optimizing student learning to personalize student learning. And that has involved working with um, attention to social emotional data like we've never done before using computer adaptive assessment information and also um, i forgot to bring this up earlier is really placing a focus on strengths what's right with learners in our school system focusing on that first know that when we did the rollout um, of Common Core, and we also received an investment um, from the federal government through a Race to the Top grant um, in December of 2012. One of the key engagement uh, opportunities we had was that all of our employees gathered, and that would be close, you know, over 500 employees, and we all participated in a strengths assessment ourselves, so that the message is that 
we're in a new time and focusing on strengths is really what it's about to really move forward for every child. So that was just another piece of the engagement. But again, the personalization piece, um, the time, Kristen had brought that up. I think that's some of the adjustments that we've had to make. And not necessarily like we don't want to go forward uh, with Common Core, but the pace of learning, the lack of time for reflection that's really needed, those to me I think are standing out some of the detracting elements. I, I would share that. I don't think we've had anyone detracting on we shouldn't be doing Common Core, but it's more the how, it's the workload. Um, as Karen mentioned, we also have a race to the top grant, so there are some pieces of that that are helping us and giving us the tools that we need to make Common Core implementation maybe a little bit easier than other districts, but at the same time, it's also more stuff that we're learning right now in the midst of Common Core. So there's the workload and the time, I think, are the biggest things that become stumbling pot stumbling blocks for um, the people involved. Okay, Superintendent Ladd, uh, same question to you, and perhaps you can introduce Elk Grove briefly just uh, before you answer. Elk Grove Unified School District uh, is proud to serve 62,000, approximately 62,000 students. 59% uh, of our student population would be um, termed to come from lower socioeconomic backgrounds. We have about 10,000 English language learners. Um, about 10% of our student uh, special needs population right on average with the rest of the state. Um, about 80 languages spoken in the district. We have uh, 39 elementary schools, nine high schools, comprehensive, nine middle schools, four alternative and community schools, adult program, TK program, uh, three to five year old special needs population. So uh, we're pretty much full service. <laughs> uh, we, uh, our demographics, we really are the face of California. We have a, a very rich and very, very diverse population, which is uh, pretty well balanced uh, throughout the, uh, the district. I think the one note that um, I would attach to that diversity is that we are watching, particularly coming out of this very, very bad recession, uh, a, a widening between the have and have not populations and it's certainly something that you want to uh, pay attention to and I know everybody in this room is, is probably doing that. Uh, with regard to engaging the community, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, individual elements you referenced a wide array. The first thing I would say is that we've had a very robust uh, uh, presence providing as much information about the Common Core standards uh, that we can gather. Uh, Liz Grass, which our Director of Communications is here today, and she and many of our folks have uh, brought those materials together, put them online, put them on the web, brought people's attention to that, uh, continue to do that, and it's very timely. The county offices have provided great information, CDE has done that as well. And we have colleagues in the district, uh, Larray Blumquist, who is our language arts uh, curriculum specialist, actually worked with folks and put online a uh, writing rubric that has gone, uh, I would say, viral, but really it's, it's been hit by many, many states that have had departments of education call, uh, want to know if they can use it. We just say certainly, but make sure you give attribution. Uh, we've seen it go uh, all across the country. In fact, we've had international folks uh, taking a look at it as well. And so there's uh, a number of other examples of how we're, we're engaging folks. Something that Maggie said um, um, that I want to go back to, we, we do enjoy a collaboration. Um, early on in the rollout of the Common Core in terms of getting people on board, um, I used uh, the analogy that we're on a car ferry going across the lake, and I said, you've got one foot on the ferry, one foot on the dock, you gotta get off the dock, because we're not staying there, we're going across the lake. And I wanna knock down this anxiety, and, and Maggie and I have shared that message as she said, and we've used that um, to um, empower, put more light, less heat on the notion as we go through this process of change that we allow people to uh, feel comfortable to say, and I've been in classrooms and we've introduced Go Math, a, a math program, and teachers would say, Steve, I'm, I'm only two days ahead of the kids, and we go, it's quite acceptable, and you get a year's experience after a year. You don't get a year's experience after a week, and if you, ex if you understand that, you appreciate that, it empowers people to feel comfortable, and, and I know that Maggie and her team are doing the same kinds of things. A couple of other points 
uh, I would make the first our board did adopt uh, this, the uh, Common Core state standards. Uh, California had adopted it. We didn't adopt it the day after they did. It was about a year or so after, but we adopted it. We've had a number of workshops, as, as uh, Karen has said, in, in their district, very similar. But here's where I want to at least bounce off my colleagues in the room. Um, I think the parent community, uh, quite frankly, is interested in the Common Core. But my sense is they're interested in understanding the Common Core as it relates to my child in the classroom every single day. So if we were going to give them a quiz on what does the Common Core standards look like and you know, tell us how it's different from state standards of the past, uh, I'm sure that there are people that are very adroit at being able to describe it. My sense is there's a lot more people that are just saying, what does my child need to know and how is it different and how do I communicate that? And I think on the, on the uh, how do I communicate that front, uh, our teachers are doing a remarkable job. They're translating this movement uh, in a way that adopts a, the change process. Uh, they're face to face with parents on a daily basis. They're being able to give examples. We've had any number of parent math nights uh, throughout. If I've heard of anyone that's got anxiety, and I think a lot of the parents are anxious because their, their first and second graders are now asked they believe asked to do calculus. It's <laughs> just not so. It's third grade. <laughs> but uh, being able to knock down that anxiety and be able to talk with them about the why we're doing what we're doing is equally important. And that conversation is not in the stratosphere of the content uh, necessarily or the or the matrix, but really why is this important for young people today, uh, K-12? pre-K-12 all the way through, and, and I think that that's taking place. Um, I believe the other part about the communication that's important for us, and we've been diligent about that, is each of the groups that you identified, uh, David, are uh, important, but they all have different needs in terms of that communication. This isn't going to be a one-size-fits-all communication pattern. Just put it in one letter, send it out, and everybody's going to get it. You have to tailor it to the individuals. Um, there were equal numbers of conversation questions to us about, so what does this mean for PI? How does this translate to AYP? How do we, are, I mean, and so, but that's a very different conversation for people that have a, a genuine interest in understanding it, but that may or may not have a, a, a crosswalk between the Common Core for a parent who may be familiar with it, but it would have a different set of uh, expectations or meanings. Um, so we're, we're continuing to do that. We've got uh, getting to the core of the matter, newsletters that are now going out monthly. We've had any number of experiences that our parents, our teachers, and administrators doing a wonderful job sharing that. We've had them at board meetings. We've shared it with the board, and we'll continue to, to take that deep dive. Um, Maggie and I have had the pleasure of, uh, of being invited uh, by uh, community members who uh, said that they were uh, concerned parents of Elk Grove, uh, and that they wanted to do a common core night, and they invited us to be on a panel with uh, another colleague, Mark Cerruti, and so Maggie, Mark, and I were on the uh, uh, pro side of common core, and there were three individuals, a board member and two others, Dr. Evers from uh, Stanford uh, came, and uh, uh, a parent who was um, uh, against the common core. Um, and we accepted the invitation because it was important for us to uh, be front and center with our community so that they understood why we believe, as we do, that Common Core is a good thing for students. It empowers teachers, and we want to see that take place. Uh, likewise, we wanted to make sure, and if you're in your community and have people that want to uh, have this conversation, what we said at the very beginning, and I'll close on this point, is we're not here to debate the federalism question. And we heard a lot of that, that, that this whole notion is that the federal government is overreaching, it's a national curriculum, uh, how dare you, when did this get approved, and, and there we said to them, you know, we're not here for the politics of it, we're here to understand what's going to take place, how do we embrace this change, and why it's good for kids, and we'll be able to engage any part of that conversation, but not the politics. 
and it was an interesting meeting. It was a, a videotaped, YouTube, um, and blog, and both of us have our SAG card. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we're waiting for the full, uh, full length movie to appear. Uh, and the royalties. Um, yeah. So uh, I would stop there. Uh, that when you speak of detractors, that event was one of the things that first came to mind because um, we fully were aware there was an agenda. And our, but our agenda was to really refocus it on what's happening in the classroom. Um, we are very transparent of, of what we are doing in the district. There's no secret of what, what our plan is, what's happening. <laughs> what came out of that forum was a real understanding of um, maybe what we didn't do quite as well and where we need to go to improve communication, not only with the community, but within our own teachers. Um, there's a lot of falsehoods that were stated in questions and it kind of blew my mind away that, that the community was coming away with that kind of impression. So. Um, I, I personally felt I needed to touch bases with teachers and say, Are, do you need additional resources in order to be able to communicate with your parents? What questions are you receiving that you don't feel maybe comfortable answering and, and give us some guidance so that we can give you the tools? Um, Dr. Ladd is right. The, the parents, majority of parents want what's best for their kids and they want to be able to help their kids. And this is a very frustrating time because they're coming home with homework they have no clue what to do with. So as we're looking at school sites engaging their parent communities, um, the, the big thing is parent universities. Back to school nights are shifting somewhat to more of an educational component of come learn about math, come learn about writing paragraphs. And I think that is, that's a new way to bring our parents closer to schools and not feel that disconnect of, of I don't know how to help my child. My message to a lot of parents is just talk with your child. Have, get to know their thinking. Have them explain why they're thinking things. Because that's where Common Core is, is explaining and that vocabulary. I'm not so much worried about any of the actual tasks that I'm teaching in school. I want them to engage in conversation. That will make them more successful in the tasks that they're doing in school. Um, we continue to have school board meetings where we have interesting um, questions and concerns, and they're usually of political nature, or um, are we taking DNA, or have we checked to see if the, the radiation component of our wireless systems that are going in. So it, you can, it's not really about the standards, it's about other things that are just detracting from that. But what we've learned is that those questions that do come up in school board, there's a way to address that so that everybody who might be out there having a similar question can get an answer. And that's where our communications department, the district, has really shifted kind of some of their thinking. And thanks to Lorraine, who had some of these um, amazing ideas during the middle of the forum, uh, we've learned communication is the key with all parties. And um, I think as it becomes more comfortable and people start to realize that the majority of California standards are still in the Common Core standards, it's just how we're approaching it is different, and the curriculum's gonna look a little bit differently. So Dr. Ladd, um, the state provided some resources to all California school districts to implement Common Core, and they, they sort of identified three priorities for the use of those resources. How have you thought strategically about those resources, and specifically about their allocation between technology, professional development, and instructional materials? Um, we have. Um, the lion's share of the dollars that came into Elk Grove, we put in place to ensure that we would be set up to allow all of our young people uh, access for the assessment. And so the lion's share, I want to say about $9 million of the $12 million we got, we funneled right in to ensure that we have access and, and wireless and uh, broadband and, and the technology itself to be able to allow students and teachers uh, the opportunity to do the assessment online. Uh, we're bringing it in. We phased that technology in terms of two years of purchase because it's on warranty. 
And if you bring it in this year for a, a small uh, field test of the test, um, that clock starts ticking. And so we wanted to build a model that would optimize our testing window, uh, get it as short as we could, realizing we didn't want to overspend and get that done. Then next year, bring the rest of the uh, uh, instructional technology on board. Much of the work I'm sure my colleagues in this room are doing as well is we wanted to build it in a way that once the testing was done, that it was a resource to all of our teachers to be able to use for instructional delivery. And so that was a driving factor in how and what we did with our technology as we go forward. Uh, we took the rest and, and uh, put out a million and a half for, for professional development, about a million dollars uh, for um, uh, instructional materials. Now on the instructional materials side of the house, um, if I had it to do all over again, I would have liked to have developed the gold sticker from our textbook and materials salespeople that said Common Core approved. Uh, <laughs> I, I would be talking to you from some other place because the uh, stickers that are on stuff, and I'm, I'm being somewhat tongue in cheek, but the reality is it's really gonna take time for that material to, to catch up in many ways to the instruction and to uh, allow it to really be the robust instructional materials that I envision it will take place over the years. And so we had uh, built into our district instructional materials adoption cycles and dollars that we've been able to carve out. So uh, that was kind of the way we broke out the dollars. Uh, we also rolled out Common Core in ways that were um, instructive and smart about the human condition. We realized that we wanted to start in mathematics. We started in the lower grades so that in elementary it would be, uh, let's say, K, K2, 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 and then three, six up. So, because for a, a teacher having to uh, gather and understand a full curriculum, English, math, then social studies, and science down the road, uh, it made more sense to allow our staff to bifurcate that, to work together in, in the uh, the plan, in my opinion, really attests to the importance of allowing people space to work with it, unbundle it, and so that would be another element. And so you know, we'll see where it goes from there. And Maggie, else do you have anything? Um, I, I think the, we've had very positive success with our GoMath adoption the way that we did it. It was the K2 <coughs> one, year, one year English language arts for 3 6 in that same year. And then the next year we flipped. And it, it's all stressful, <laughs> a lot of it we put on ourselves, but it assisted in at least giving people some foundation to focus on and then knowing that they're gonna pick up little pieces in the other subject areas as they move along and the next year they'll get stronger. Um, we also have um, the Bechtel Grant, which has been providing phenomenal um, professional development in mathematics, not only with how to do math, but the teaching strategies of math. And so um, that's a, a K, K8. And um, it's it really nice to see teacher leaders going, getting this wonderful information on both sides of both strategies as well as actually doing math and becoming more comfortable. With it. And then taking back to PLCs on their school sites and working in the collaborative communities. Um, that is, that's what's gonna make it really successful for teachers, is that low stress, sharing, it's not competitive, it is meant to be um, students of students. You know, we, we are students ourselves all the time as we're learning these things. And if we don't create that environment within our own working conditions, how can we truly create that for students and expect them to do the same thing? So it's my hope that as we build time some, somewhere along the structure, we get time for more of that, um, it transfers down to the same thing that we're expecting for students. And I'm showing in Gulf Joint Union, I've gotten it wrong twice, so i <laughs> it once. Uh, how have you thought strategically about the use of those resources that the state provided? Um, we uh, received $750,000 uh, $750, uh, for the Common Core State Standards uh, funds. Um, it's it's uh, where we are with the spending of those resources is that we are not making 
final decisions on how to spend the dollars until we take things through the LCAP process. Now, we're able to um, have that gift of time because, again, we receive the race to the top funds. So what we have um, spent dollars on um, uh, to implement the Common Core through federal funds at this point um, does uh, support technology infrastructure and some blended learning tools that help with personalization. But so much of also of what we've spent so far has to do about professional development. And our teachers um, have been involved with the process um, of developing common units for uh, implementing the Common Core. And I thought, Kristen, that that would be <laughs> something interesting to talk about because resources have been budgeted to support that effort, units by design. Um, over the summer, we had a five-day understanding by design uh, in-service professional development opportunity for eight hours a day, um, where we were instructed on how to look at those standards and then uh, develop units around them by developing the um, essential questions, designing um, our own performance tasks, and then designing lessons to meet the goals of those questions and tasks. And so that was a lot of our professional development this year. Um, again, we have very strong PLC work, not only at site level, but this year we have uh, one Wednesday a month that is district-wide PLC time where we are working on those units <coughs> and then having an opportunity to reflect on those units. We've des uh, developed, um, I'm trying to remember the term we use for them, but people who are very, basically a unit oversight. So we have some people who are helping to do the writing. And then after those uh, units have been put into place and taught, then this oversight, which is also made up of kindergarten teachers, looks at the units, has taught the units, and then goes back and tries to restructure and make any um, alterations that need to happen to make it more successful. So that's been a very big part of not only our professional development, but also our PLC work. So we haven't spent a lot of money on curriculum at this point, but we have spent a lot of um, time and effort and um, dollars training so that uh, the teachers can develop the curriculum for math. And it's been very successful, I think, so far. Again, time. It's a lot of time. So as, as you all know, uh, the, the Common Core state standards don't directly address uh, the problems of English language learners um, or special, edu special education students. Um, and the local control funding formula and the local control accountability plans put a special emphasis on those students. How have you adapted your Common Core strategy to address the needs of particularly English language learners but low income students? more generally, students with special needs more generally. Dr. Lyle, I'll start with you. It's Kara's turn. No. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> you know, one of the things that, that I'm struck by this conversation, at least in my thinking, it's been very helpful and I, I appreciate the question, David. I'm not, I'm not viewing the adoption of Common Core State Standards as a standalone kind of something over here that you just lay another log on the fire. So when I stop to think about what is the strategy for students that are low income or English learners, um, the outcome remains exactly the same. We want to ensure that they're getting all of the skills that they need to be academically successful, uh, to continue to grow and uh, achieve and make sure that they have access to all of the kinds of programs uh, opportunities that all of our youngsters have and so I would say that we're going to disaggregate the needs of those populations uh, relative to what student learning uh, student learners are what does the data tell us how do we know that how do we evaluate that um, we've been uh, very fortunate we've got uh, a very strong uh, platform for special needs students and I know that we have been investing a great deal of professional development a great deal of direct instruction uh, to making sure that all our special needs kids are ready for KC, they can pass, they can graduate with or without accommodations. Many of them are doing fabulously well. Uh, lower income populations, it, it isn't the lower income per se that LCAP and LCF ought to drive us to. What we ought to be doing is understanding our kids by name and by need so that we really can then use those resources to come back and support what takes place in a variety of, of uh, strategies um, all the way from making sure that they have the skill set they need the foundational skill set as age appropriate and grade appropriate to be able to be successful uh, we're really looking at on grade uh, reading in third grade we want to make sure that all kids coming out of third grade can read at grade level 
Uh, folks are doing tremendous work there. Our secondary schools are looking at access to be it AVID, honors, AP classes, building the networks, building the bridges, going back and finding uh, the kids that need credit recovery. Uh, don't do the same thing they had during the course of the year, just louder or online, but rather uh, coming back and really being very, very strategic and thoughtful. And I think that LCAP and LCFF will be a very nice balance between what uh, teachers uh, have uh, needs for and schools have needs for and then the district overview and the umbrella is how do we leverage it to get the most possible and, and that's the way we'll approach the work uh, as we go forward. Um, good teaching benefits all students. Good strategies. It, it, that's what we strive to do as a teacher. So it, just because we have this new emphasis due to funding and the LCAP doesn't necessarily mean that we totally shift how we're teaching students. Um, I do know that uh, together we have developed kind of a rubric to go back into classrooms and kind of take an audit of <coughs> our teaching practices. And by gathering that kind of information, we can focus on what's working, <coughs> what maybe we thought was working isn't working anymore, and get some more ideas of how can we strategically focus our good teaching skills maybe on certain groups. It, it comes back to, as Dr. Glatt said, the individual student. And that's always the desire of a classroom. Um, I think in our district, because we have maintained class size reduction, that has assisted a lot with all of our population. But we have a goal of, of continuing that, especially at high income, um, low poverty schools, I'm switching my words were high poverty schools and high incident of EL students we would love to see lower class sizes for them to even strategically um, identify smaller classes for better skills and better learning environments and I'm getting tired I can tell my brain's going <laughs> <laughs> okay Dr. Show. I, I can agree about um, you know, what the Common Core State Standards Implementation is really about um, serving every child um, individually. And one of the things that uh, is, has been a best practice for us, and now it is transforming to an even um, more individualized level, is that we uh, have used a practice where we, we called it somewhat of a checking for understanding document. Every child by name, um, where our, our teachers <coughs> know um, what special needs um, uh, children have. And it, it has been something that has been helpful in guiding academic conferences uh, for children with, with different strengths and needs. What's happening now, and, and starting with this, um, is that I, I'm right now, I'm responsible for 100% of all learners in our school system meeting or exceeding personalized learning plan goals. And the reason that we can go there now is because we've been using that practice of checking for understanding in every child by name. And now with the technology tools that are out there and um, I would say the strength of our PLCs, we really can, can do that work. And I think that if we can have individual goals for every child in our school system, pre-K through grade eight, we will have conquered the achievement gap. And I, you know, I think that that's going to be a, a major, um, say, uh, change that, that's so very, very important for our school system. I wanna also say that in our school system, we have had organizational consistencies over time. And we're not throwing our organizational consistencies out because of common core state standards. We are auditing our best practices. And there are organizational consistencies that we have for English learners in our school system in terms of English language development occurs five days a week, at least 200 minutes per week. Our teachers have gone through training of technical assistance through the California Reading and Literature Project. There's an acronym called RALLY, but to help our, our teachers, administrators, and the superintendent know how to better um, look at how we, we better ensure that our students are progressing in English language development. 
I know that our County Office of Education has had a series of sessions with Dr. Lori Olson, and I think she's coming back as well. And her research has <coughs> been really important for us to look at, particularly in the area of, I want to say, the social emotional aspect of serving English learners, the critical uh, importance of goal setting as well. And for our students, our English learners and parents to understand and engage in the learning and the importance of progression in English language development. We do need to get better in terms of our long-term English learners because we do have, have uh, English learners in our school system that get to a certain point and someone gets stuck. And so we, you know, we want to look at that research and, and better apply it. Um, when I think of, of all of our students and maybe particularly, say, students that maybe don't have resources at home that they have at school, is that we are looking, we, all of our, our school libraries have now become Bright Future Learning Centers. That means that they're open after school, they're open till 6 every evening, and they're open in the summer. And so some of the um, computer adaptive uh, programs that we're using in our school system, Chromebooks that we have in our classrooms, we have families that, and children, that may not have uh, wireless access at home. And so we want a place, we want learning spaces uh, that, that they can have those opportunities to go beyond the school day as well. I also want to highlight that um, our efforts in pre-kindergarten, just in terms of what it's meant for, um, for English learners and, and say children um, in low income situations where maybe, um, you know, there's certain skills or opportunities that they haven't had and so that's been really important for catch-up work and enrichment and that has also included home visits this school year uh, in TK3 this year also we have what are now called personalized learning plans which have taken the place of former what we would call report cards or progress reports and so every student does have personal goals in in three different areas so we truly are looking at each child and making a year plus growth with each child from where they are and not just one size fits all for every student. There are some struggles that Common Core do pose as a kindergarten teacher because it is so language rich and explaining thinking and having collaborative conversations and those things are so embedded in everything you do. That does pose some special unique issues with children who um, might not have the capacity with the English language. So you try to buddy them up with someone who might be bilingual or someone who has a little bit or has the same language as them. But I, you do need to understand that Common Core does pose some special issues for English language learners because it is so langu language and conversation um, dependent. The other thing is right now, because Common Core is so new, I think a lot of the courseware that you might be looking at in your districts and that we're using in our districts is, is only one language. It's only in English. So that is also an issue when you are trying to have children do adaptive courseware, adaptive assessments that may only be in one language. So those are just some unique issues that you may have. Okay, well, I, I have a lot more questions, but I'm not the only one with questions, probably. So uh, um, if there are questions from the audience, we'd be happy to take those now. Yes, Nancy. Um, I'm wondering, given that you uh, both districts have some additional funds through some grants that other districts may or may not have access to, and the importance of time, using time, um, based on the structures people have, do you have any additional recommendations that um, you know how how to bring teachers together, the kinds of things that you're doing that um, cost money? Uh, but then for some districts, they may not have access to additional resources. Any thoughts on that? Um, our secondary schools have an early out, or late start, mm -hmm. late start. Um, Dr. Ladd and I, and I'll give a plug for Shannon Brown over there too, we participate in CalTURN, which is a, a California Teacher Union and Reform Network. And there is a lot of um, sharing of that kind of information of how do you create that time. And early outs and late starts are a big part of what we have heard other districts incorporate in order to give that meaningful during the day teacher to teacher, administrator to teacher, group, PLC kind of uh, environment. And that's something that, that I think we're gonna have to take a look at because there is a finite amount of time. I would share that the shortened Wednesdays that we've had in our school system were not grant funded. That's a practice that we've had for some time. 
Um, the part that, um, and again, this is not a money uh, matter, but it was working with our teachers union in terms of, of, of how um, to most effectively use the modified Wednesdays. Um, what's happening uh, is that at least, I think it's about once a month, we have from teachers from across the school system that come together. So that's a variation on our professional learning communities. It wasn't added cost, it was about um, working with our teachers union, um, listening to our teachers in terms of really what could accelerate that change. And I think that's what has been, um, I think, exciting for me as a superintendent is just to see the power of the professional learning community and what our teachers are seeing. It's like, you know, we need to get together more frequently to, to share what's working, what's not working. How did you innovate to do that to move things forward? So not a money thing, it's just how you use the time that you have. But I also say, I also am thinking that the themes that we've talked about, that both our districts have talked about, and in I'm thinking of consultations with our union, um, working with dif different, say, groups in terms of the LCAP, these are areas that uh, I think you know, some of our, say, issues of implementation or areas to work on that, um, we're, we're going to need to be factoring into that LCAP and where we put dollars because the time, reflection, training, uh, all those things need to be taken in, into account to move forward. Other questions? Dave. Yes, please. I know that uh, Elk Grove uh, was involved early on with instructional rounds in your district, and I'm wondering uh, how that has continued or not in terms of uh, of providing uh, necessary data for uh, teachers uh, in, in terms of uh, implementing Common Core? Um, to a varying degrees, uh, we did in fact uh, implement instructional rounds, and I'm sure most, if not everyone in the room is aware, it's a program uh, uh, Dr. Elmore from Harvard and a team of folks put together. <laughs> The power of instructional rounds, was, in my opinion, was two points that I would share. One is it triangulates the notion that if you're going to change one aspect of the teaching and learning paradigm, then you've got to change all three for it to have coherence, my words in translation. So if you're going to change the curriculum, not only the content standards, but then how you're going to assess it, then it changes what the dynamic is on the students and the learners, and it changes the dynamic on what's taking place uh, in the instructional delivery. And so it's a perfect metaphor of what's taking place with Common Core. Um, the second thing that has been fabulous to watch is getting through the first wave of reluctance on the part of professionals who, for the longest time, have lived in, in silos, not because they want to, but because of the way schools have been designed from the cookie cutter uh, kind of model uh, and allowing people to, to say, you know, I'm going to share and learn from my colleague next door. I'm going to watch that good practice. Uh, I'm, I'm a little reluctant to have someone come in my room because of the, uh, the evaluative aspect. And so that, I think that's natural. That's the human condition. And kudos to, to the teachers and administrators in a number of schools that are doing it that have pushed through to realize, you know what, I do have professional colleagues that I do have an opportunity to listen and learn from. I've got to empower myself, I've got to empower and listen to my colleagues. I don't have to be so fearful about saying, well, I'm 100% I'm perfect in everything. And those schools that have used that uh, instructional rounds model have, uh, I think, found ways to build the strengths of each other uh, to not look at it critically and say, nanner, 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 you shouldn't have, but rather, uh, wow, that was terrific. What did you do? That was, show me, I'd like to know. And so it really has broadened uh, uh, those opportunities for staff. And I think instructional rounds, once you push through that first uh, condition of trust and you make sure that people feel that they're being listened to, that they're being honored in terms of the, you know, truly honored in the work that they're doing, um, it will be a good strategy in the schools in our district that are continuing to use it. I think we'll continue to use it. <laughs> Along that line, I would just add uh, one other aspect to this. Um, in 97, we adopted content standards, and now we're adopting new content standards. And in 2000, pick the year, we're going to adopt something else. And, and what is really exciting about the way, um, uh, kind of where we landed, 
we're able to embrace what we know about learning and teaching, and we've seen a whole range of research that is now here that we didn't have necessarily in 97. But it's building this professional um, collaboration between everybody that's involved, all the stakeholders, including the parents, everybody's got a role to play. And so as opposed to going in and trying to do it in this slice, we're gonna do this on this day, on this time, with this piece, seeing how it all fits, including career technical education as being a great resource to demonstrate what Common Core is asking everyone to be able to do, um, it all fits. And so uh, it's exciting, it is, uh, it's gonna take time, and we all know that, but I think rounds will be a good strategy, and everyone on campus uh, has the ability to, to have a real vibrant role. And I think that's exciting and, and deserving. But I think as we're doing this, and, and Dr. Webb touched on a few words, it's trust, it's collaboration, it's what is the purpose um, that it's seen as meaningful and beneficial. Um, there have been sites that have been extremely successful, and it's because of the dynamic and, and the relationship that's created on campus. Um, there are some campuses where it's not been successful because people have been uh, evaluative, negative, and, and it's not been used to improve instruction. And, and that's not to say we don't need to have hard conversations. When you don't see good things happening in a classroom, you need to have a hard conversation. But it's how you have that conversation. It's either something that drives someone to be better, it doesn't make them feel like they've been demeaned and demoralized. Quickly, yeah. What, what do you need from teachers? What do you need from your principals? to implement common clubs? I think we need you to be a facilitator, a supporter, to ask us what is it that we need, where are we struggling, how can, how can you um, provide us time or resources to be able to improve. I would love to have my principal come in a room, take my kids for a lesson so that I could go to my next door neighbor and watch how they're teaching writing or teaching a lesson in mathematics. To have a half hour time where I could just go Take over my kids. Do a, do a do something easy. Do an art project, which aren't always easy. Let me rephrase that. <laughs> do, do character ed. Do something that that not only connects me to my peers, but connects you to my students. I think you as a facilitator. I don't need you to be the expert. That should really be my role. I'm supposed to be the expert in my classroom. I need you to facilitate me being an expert. Kristen, do you want to add something? I would, and just to, to, I don't think that they need to be an expert, but I do think they need to be the educational leaders at the school. I think they need to attend the same Common Core workshops we are. Um, it's, you know, they, they need to have kind of an overview of all the grade levels where I need to be an expert in kindergarten. And so I think it's really important that they are at those in service getting the same information, being knowledgeable. I do think that any way that they can support teachers in getting into each other's classrooms, having the time, getting creative with release time at camp on campuses, um, and being in the classroom so that they can give us feedback in a non-threatening, supportive way so that we know what is working and what, what they see as opposed to us when we're kind of you know on the front lines trying to work through it as we're doing it the first time. To have that other set of eyes in the classroom is extremely helpful. Okay. I want to thank our panelists from Elk Grove and uh, Galt, Union, Galt Joint Union, and uh, um, we will now take a, a short break, and then we'll come back to the second panel. But thank you all very much.